I'm Ruth. And I'm Brenton. Welcome to Spectrum today. We're going to have a great time together on the program. Appreciate you joining in with us today. Well, yes. Ruth, there's a lot in the news these days, and uh, I sure. guess a great place to start might be with the aftermath of the Hurricane Florence. You know, that right. is not as prominent as a news item right now, but the flooding mm -hmm. has really reached dramatic proportions. I was going to say epic. I'm not sure that's really true, but dramatic proportions as I believe it's, I read somewhere that there were at flood stages and swollen rivers, like 14 uh, different rivers at flood stages or at, at very, uh, you know, just terrible circumstances of people losing so much. It killed at least 36 people, which was the other day when we reported it was about 17, I think. So the number has increased to 36 people. And um, of those uh, that died in North Carolina, including Duplin County, right? Okay. And so there was a family talking about the family arriving to their home. They've lived there for 30 years. They get there and it's just, um, they're going to have to basically start all over again. You know, a flood, too, uh, is, is so devastating because of what it does to, to right. structures. Uh, because it destroys things with the mud. I think I, I missed, uh, said this, it was, uh, 14 river gauges are at major flood stages, not 14 rivers, river gauges. So, yeah, that's just a lot of, uh, a lot of water and it's, it's not getting, I mean, we're past the storm actually hitting by several days, but the, right. the weather continues. They mentioned animals that have now. died. Yes. I mean, I, I don't think of that. I usually think of, of the people, but sure. many, like, Lots chickens, of chickens, I believe. that Tens of thousands uh -huh. of chickens. Just uh, crazy, crazy. Mm -hmm. Well, here's another one. This is a little bit better news. All right. Anybody up for some better news? Okay. Kim Jong-un, and uh, the, who's the, the leader of North Korea, and the South Korea uh, Korean president have announced that it looks like, which is President uh, Moon Jae-in, yes. they've agreed uh, in their second day of meetings to a very ambitious uh, way of tackling some things so that the tensions will be reduced, even wanting to jointly host, uh, and I think it's 2032, yeah. the Olympics. Some Olympics, Trying right. to put an Olympic bid in. Will they be selected? Mm -hmm. Nobody knows, but that's one of their, their hopes. But they're talking. talking they're talking, and um, we're, we're not sure yet in, in return what, they haven't spelled out the specifics of what they're wanting. Um, for Kim Jong Un, remember when he talked with President Trump, and when they when they had their uh -huh. their meeting, meeting. Their summit. Yes, and so we'll see what happens. But at least they're talking. They were mentioning that with this president, he's done more than any other president has been able to, with Kim Jong Un. So right. So you know, there's, there's some cautious optimism mm -hmm. that good things are happening in North Korea. Do you remember as a kid? Did you ever play a game called Slug Bug? Did you ever do that? If you saw a Volkswagen uh, bug, kind of your friend would get to hit you on the arm, and then what? vice versa. No. Oh, I well, we I had one. Did you, have, you did you ever have a Volkswagen? <laughs> no. We did. We well, did. we didn't have a bug. We had a mini bus for a very short. Oh, a Volkswagen little van thing. Yeah. My aunt had one of those. I love that because they had all the windows and the curtains. You could have. <laughs> that was so cool. Ours was short lived. But so we had a little red one, it's cherry, uh, candy apple red that my dad, um, he fixed up, he souped it up, candy apple red, the interior, I remember this so clearly because it's one of the vehicles I learned to drive on officially, well, standard stick, uh -huh. which was so much fun, and it was red, black, and gray plaid interior. Ooh. That thing was so cool, except... You know, I did have issues with it. It was a fun story about my dad, but he was the best. And anyway, yeah, that's fun. Well, the reason I ask is the uh, folks at Volkswagen say that the Beetle production will end in July of 2019 with a final edition wrapping up the car's uh, existence, <laughs> at least to this point. Now, they have taken it out of production before and yeah. brought it back. So people are saying it could be that it will just have a hiatus and return again. Maybe return as an electric car. It's some something that's that. been said, yes. So we'll see. You kind of it's... have some fond memories of, of the V-Beetle, don't you? <laughs> I do. I do. It was a fun car. Oh, wow. I never had a, a Beetle. So that's, that's kind of a, a different one. OK, well, talking about vehicles and um, the, in, the increase of, peep, of consumers buying larger vehicles, 
Ford F-150s, SUVs, you might have like, what is that, an Acadia, that's a large vehicle as oh, well. Yeah. And if you've ever noticed, I don't know if you've ever noticed, maybe you have, older homes have, or maybe think of it this way, newer homes have huge garages. And you never think, I've always wondered, why is that so big? Well, they're doing it to accommodate the larger vehicles because yes. Many times what happens is you get those S uh, Ford 150s or you get a, an SUV of some sort and in your, it doesn't fit in your garage. Now they tell us that the footprint of the vehicles width wise has not changed much. No. But height wise and, length. and lengthwise right. they have. Mm -hmm. We're told that Americans are driving the largest vehicles that they've ever driven. Most uh, standard garages they tell us would, stand, uh, they, they would house a, a, a big truck as well, long they're as about they don't eight have... feet high, right? Usually, most of them are eight feet high, but now they're building them ten feet high. Yes. Well, I was going to say, as long as they don't have light packages or like racks the rack or on the, on the roof, on we pass. People, and by the way, people are spending thousands of dollars to remodel their to, their garages to fit their vehicles. They are. I never thought that was possible, but I guess you can. And also, what people are doing are there are people out there that will come in and organize your garage, because you know how we have things in our garage? They organize your garage to fit your vehicles. Is that right? That's pretty amazing. That is pretty cool. Yeah. Well, we, we've noticed, as we've been driving by some newer homes, that some of the garages on these newer homes Man. are gigantic. I mean, they are Huge. big, big. Cathedral ceilings. That's the man cave, right? That's oh, the new oh, man oh, cave. Is love that? It. Those garages, because they're crazy. I, we went by one, and he, the owner of that home, had everything in it. I was like, why is that so large? And as we passed, because the door was open, he has a huge, it looks like a, an RV, isn't it? Like an RV inside of that garage. <laughs> wow. Crazy. Oh, and every guy in town is like, <laughs> yes, please. OK. Yeah. Here's a crazy one. There's this ongoing battle, apparently, on uh, social media. Whether uh, Sesame Street, uh, for, for the characters, you, got, do you, do you remember watching Sesame Street as a kid? Yes, I love Sesame Street. Yeah, there was all the guys uh, that you would watch, the puppets. There was Cookie Monster, yes, Grover, yes, Big Grover. Bird, Ernie and Bert. Yes. Okay. Last Many few others, years. I am drawing a blank right now. <laughs> last few years, them, there's been a discussion whether Ernie and Bert were gay. The guy uh, named Frank Oz, who did so many of the Muppet voices and voices. was the, some of the voicing on this, said that that's absolutely ridiculous. Um, that, and, and, you know, first of all, why does there need puppets. to be a discussion about puppets? First of all, why, did, why do we need to have a discussion about that? I, I appreciated what he said was he was said that they were friends. They were always meant to be friends, and they were so opposite. Do you remember how opposite they were? Oh, and yeah. it, was, it was intended for us to to um, to know that it is possible to be friends with someone who is completely opposite from you, and that's what he intended. And it was, and he said, why does it need to be that they need to identify as something, and why isn't it good enough that they're just friends? Yeah. Why isn't it good enough that they're just friends? Besides that, because they there's are an puppets. agenda. It's it's a tragedy that we have to have an agenda, a social agenda, uh, a sexual agenda anymore in this nation all of the time. That's trying to to push a sexual identity onto little children. After it's some, disgusting. After some pressure over that or or conversation, and people were pressing him on it, he said. It would be, he goes, I am not going to say that that's what they were because that's not what they were intended to be. I'm talking about Ernie and Bert. He says, but if it, it would be the same thing if you wanted to come out and say after all these years that Ernie was a football player or a quarterback for whatever. He goes, it's just not true. And this is the same thing. It's just not true. They were, they're friends and they're puppets. Yep. And I still like Ernie and Bert. They there were you funny. Go. Okay. Well. There are so many things going on, of course. I mean, we could, we could talk a little bit about the things with Brett Kavanaugh. I don't think we want to do that. I mean, we just don't have time. There's just there, there's things on the, uh, oh, the generic you know, congressional this, ballot this, that's out there. There's right. just, I mean, you can, you can feed your mind with whatever you want. There's plenty of things for you to chew on today. This, this um, article shouldn't surprise us, though. So be involved with your children. Find out what they're talking about that's in their the school because there are things that... People will open doors. People will say something. Curiosity, whatever they call it. And don't let people speak evil over your kids. That's right. Or 
God did not Be make involved. a mistake when he made your children. Be involved. He made them perfectly and he gave them an identity and God does not make mistakes. Praise God for the fact that he makes us, scripture says male and female, isn't mm -hmm. that right? And he made you, and there's no two people alike. God yeah. is, is a great creator, praise God. We'll be back in a minute. certainly thankful that we can be a part of Christian broadcasting and be involved in providing you with the perspective that is faith-based. Mm -hmm. You know, in the world that we live right now, there are a lot of voices and you have to pick which ones you're going to allow into your mind. You're going to have to pick which ones you're going to allow to speak to you because there's always been uh, voices speaking mm -hmm. into our lives. But you know what? You have a chance to let God speak into your life through His Word. And uh, Alpha Omega Broadcasting is actively involved in encouraging you to be built up in your faith, to think on good things, to allow your faith to impact your actions. And that's why we're here, is to be a blessing to you, to be an encourager to you. So I would invite you to support Alpha Omega Broadcasting. I support Alpha Omega Broadcasting mm -hmm. every month. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage you to do the same. We're in a process right now of raising three, uh, for looking for 350 mm -hmm. people to give $100 to help us with the HD transition. I believe we can do that before the end of 2018. There are different ways to give and be involved. You can go visit us on the website at kazq32.org. Find out the details of the giveaway and also you can give safely online. Also on the website is the number for text to give which is 505-349-5838. You can always mail in your donation to 4501 Montgomery Boulevard Northeast, Albuquerque, New Mexico 87109 or simply call us at 505-884-8355 extension 101. However you choose to support Alpha Omega Broadcasting, remember that your donations are tax deductible and they are certainly appreciated and needed. Oftentimes we think somebody else will do it, somebody else will be a blessing. You know, God, if it's touching your heart, obey what He is speaking to you right now yeah. and do your very best. Mm -hmm. Do remember to be an encourager to the ministries you enjoy. Pick up the phone or write a note to one of the ministries that you enjoy today and let them know, I am so thankful for who you are and what you do. These ministries are investing in your life, both financially and uh, with information and with education and blessing. Speak back to them, letting them know the encouragement they are. Alpha Omega Broadcasting would like to thank all of our sponsors and everyone that participated in KAZQ's first annual golf tournament. Our diamond and pearl sponsors are Joshua Mayes with Mayes Construction, Ed and Karen McNabb Insurance Agent, Gary Pavia Luxury Design Builders LLC, and Houston Wholesale Cars LLC. We would like to recognize these businesses that sponsored the individual holes from tea to green. Awards, etc., Linda Oliver, Bank of Albuquerque, Mon Fon, Corley's Volvo and Lincoln, Rick Patel, Cross Star Ministries, David Quintana, Insurance Agents, Ed and Karen McNabb, Houston Wholesale Cars, LLC, Gary Pavia, Luxury Design Builders, LLC, Gary Pavia, Mayas Construction, Joshua Mayas, Remax Realty, Judson and Sharon McCollum, Robert Trujillo Construction, Robert Trujillo, and Sunderland Insurance, George and Philip Sunderland. We would also like to thank John Huerta at Golf Mart, Ed McNabb Insurance Agent, DJ McVeigh Schumeister at the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History, Linda Oliver at Awards Etc., and the Donut Mart on Montgomery and Jefferson Northeast. And a special thanks to all of the golfers that showed up to play and made our first tournament a success. See you next year. 
We're pleased to have with us today Pastor Vince Torres, who's with the Family Policy Alliance. Pastor, thanks for coming and sharing with us today. Thanks for having me, Pastor. We've uh, had opportunities over the years for our paths to cross at different situations and different occasions, and it's good to be able to, to be back with you today. But tell me a little bit about the Family Policy Alliance and, and how you got involved with that. And really, for folks who may not know, what is Family Policy Alliance? Sure. So I, I spent a little over 11 years working for the legislative and executive branches of our government. Uh, most recently, was working for our current lieutenant governor as his legislative liaison when I was approached by the leadership of Family Policy Alliance about their plans to establish a state-based organization here. So long story short, after some prayer, my wife and I decided to, to go along with it. And they asked me to lead this effort. And basically, Family Policy Alliance were a public policy organization. We're a public policy partner, a focus on the family. I'm sure a lot of your uh, listeners are familiar with Dr. Dobson. And, sure. and our, our vision for our state is a New Mexico where God is honored, religious freedom flourishes, families thrive, and life is cherished. So we work in the public sector to promote good public policy. We work to elect good candidates to public office and really amplify uh, the Christian voters in our government. Now, you are also involved as a pastor in the Santa Fe area, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that. Because, you know, a lot of times you hear people say, well, there should be no interaction between <laughs> church and state. There should be this firm line. I mean, it's in the Constitution, which it's not. <laughs> it's not even in any That's of right. our uh, of our uh, official documents. Mm -hmm. It's based on a letter that Jefferson wrote. That's right. That everybody... It honestly probably takes out of context. But nonetheless, how does that, uh, being a pastor, impact your engagement in the realm of the political? Well, one of the things I like to tell people is that there is nothing that our culture calls political that isn't first biblical. I mean, every issue that we talk about, I don't care whether it's a hot topic or whether it's some of the more menial things that we talk about, Good everything point. is scriptural, you know. So as a pastor, you know, I, I believe our faith should dictate our politics, that we have a responsibility as people of faith and specifically as pastors to speak the truth. And that means speaking truth on issues that are relevant to today. So I think that's a huge part of our responsibility. And I'm, I'm blessed to be able to serve in both capacities capacities because quite frankly in most conversations that you have with people about politics inevitably you get to a conversation about faith and that's just how it works I think they're intertwined and I think it's very difficult to separate them uh, yeah I, I agree with you because you, you end up with a where where's your morality where's that's right. you based in you know in, in the world that we live in today uh, the, the humanistic view is that morality changes it's mm -hmm. very fluid uh, what's right today might not be uh, right tomorrow what's wrong today might not be wrong tomorrow Whereas uh, biblical ethics are based in the truth of the Word of God, which is unchanging. That's uh, right. Scripture says that, you know, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Amen. And so, you know, it, it depends on really if, how you're going to view life. Are you going to view it from a prism of, of uh, faith or, mm -hmm. or are you going to do it through a prism that's changing? Well, well, tell us a little bit about this concept. There, there's a term called biblical citizenship. Mm -hmm. Where do you stand on that? What does that really mean? How does that you know, integrate into the policy. So, so part of our mission at Family Policy Alliance in New Mexico is advancing what we call biblical citizenship. And when I think of biblical citizenship, I like to point Christians to, to the story of Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 11, uh, there's, a, there's a wonderful verse in there that says, the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. Yes. And so when we talk about advancing biblical citizenship and what is a biblical citizen, that's exactly what it is. It's a Christian who not only stands firm in their faith, but a person who also is willing to take action. We believe that it is Christians, we have a responsibility not simply to stand for what we know to be true, but to actually act on them so that we can transform the communities in which we live for good using biblical values as our baseline. So, That's a very interesting way of thinking. I encourage you to look up that verse in, in the book of Daniel and, and, and see exactly what it says yeah. there. You know, I, I think that there's no other way uh, right now, uh, Vince, that we can look at things, but seeing even with the Supreme Court mm -hmm. nomination in front of us with Brett Kavanaugh, that one of the driving topics is the abortion debate. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, you, you, I mean, you could say that that's not the driving force, but you would be pretty much kidding yourself mm -hmm. because that's what's on national news everywhere we go. So lawmakers, citizens are really uh, impacted by that. What is the, you know, the, the look at the sanctity of life that the that the Family Policy Alliance has and how does that come into play? Because I'm sure it must be an active part of what you do. Absolutely, and it's it's one of our three core issues. So our, our three issues at Family Policy Alliance are family, life, and religious freedom. And life is probably uh, the one that most people tend to be passionate about. Here in New Mexico, we're blessed my organization to work with some other great organizations. Uh, I think of Elisa Martinez over at New Mexico Alliance 
Alliance for Life, Danine Dulce at New Mexico Right to Life. And, and what we do is, again, we, we want to promote a culture of life in our state. We're having this interview right here in what is widely known as the abortion capital of the nation. Right. Um, I had one pastor uh, from out of state recently tell me that, uh, oh yeah, New Mexico, you're a pastor there. That's where babies go to die. I mean, that's the reputation that we have. And so one of the things that we're working to do is not only to increase awareness about what's happening in our backyard, but then come the legislative session and even come elections to make sure that we have the right men and women in there who share our values on the sanctity of human life. You know, I, I would just say to, to all of us that we have to, to understand that uh, no, there's another biblical principle at play, which is whatsoever man soweth, that will he also reap. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a state, as a city, as a person, that's true. Mm -hmm. You know, if we keep sowing bad seeds, we're going to struggle as a state as individuals, whatever. Mm -hmm. We've got to start sowing better seeds. Yeah. And, and I really believe that a lot of our other problems are connected to our inability as a state, and I'm talking about as a community, mm -hmm. to come to grips with the reality that we have become the late term abortion capital of the nation and potentially the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really a sick thought. Yeah because of, of, of really the fact that very few people, very few people, I don't care what you're hearing, if you really dig the statistics, very few people really believe in late-term abortion. That's right, that's right. You know, murdering a baby in the, in the third trimester, even up to the day of their birth. Yeah, and, and as, I, as I travel the state and I meet with faith leaders, even some people who are pretty engaged, very few people know what's happening here in Albuquerque over at the clinic, you know, the late term abortions. And during the legislative session, it's a conversation that tends to come up. And, and sadly, it's one thing that we can't even reach consensus on um, is that we should at some point allow, um, allow the government to come in and restrict abortions up to a certain extent. Because like you said, if you poll New Mexicans, if you poll Americans, more and more people that are pro-choice are finding out that they're actually pro-choice up to a point. Um, it's interesting, there was, a, there was an interview with uh, Bill Maher recently, mm -hmm. and even Bill Maher, of all people who I don't agree with on anything, he said, well, you know, at some point you look at the ultrasound and you see the little baby, yeah, it's probably wrong to kill it at some point. You know, so even on the other side, I think more and more people, as we have the advances in science and technology right. and medicine, are looking at these ultrasounds and they're looking at the science and saying, yeah, we, we, need, to, we need to do something about this. Yeah, that's not the only, of course, life issue. There's assisted suicide. Mm -hmm. There were some things that were changed in the state of Hawaii. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yes. Yeah, so assisted suicide is, is is part of our you know part of our life platform, um, and and one of the reasons we we oppose it is because um, there's a lot of unintended consequences, but also we just we don't like the message that it sends. As, especially as Christians, we believe God alone you know has the right to to take innocent life, and we are very concerned about the message that we're sending not only to the terminally ill. Um, but to basically everyone, that, that somehow assisted suicide is, is a dignified form of death, you know. And um, I think most of us here in New Mexico have, some, have been impacted by suicide in some way. Um, and one of the dangerous things that we see in some of these other states is that um, assisted suicides are not the only thing that take off after a state legalizes it. In the state of Oregon, for example, between 1999 and 2010, their non-assisted suicide uh, cases rose by 49%. Yeah. And so we can see, we can see that type and often there. among the young. Very often among the young, it disproportionately affects minorities. There's all sorts of things at play. Um, there's coercion from family members. There's potential abuses from hospital and health insurance providers, all of that. And sometimes that's often lacking from the conversation. And I understand it. it's a very emotional issue. There are good people on both sides of the issue. Most recently, I was uh, in front of the Santa Fe City Council talking about this. And uh, we had a very, very good civil discussion on it. And I look forward to continuing that discussion come the legislative session. You also talked a little bit about protecting religious freedoms. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the threats that you see to religious freedom? You know, religious freedom impacts everybody. That's right. Everybody. That's what this nation was founded on, really, was on an attempt to establish religious mm -hmm. freedom. What are some of the threats that are out there? So religious freedom, you know, one of the things that I like to point people back to and just didn't happen not too long ago right here in Albuquerque, we had Elaine Hugan in photography, you know, who very politely refused to photograph a same-sex wedding. It was a case that made it all the way up to the New Mexico Supreme Court and probably one of the more troubling rulings of our state, of our, of our state Supreme Court. Um, one of the justices said this coercion to violate their conscience was a cost of doing business, a cost of citizenship in New Mexico. Uh, we don't believe that. 
that. We're thankful for some of the victories that we had recently at the Supreme Court, but we do know that there are more threats coming up and we want to be prepared to, to face those threats and preserve our religious freedom here in the state and across the country. Well, if a lot of the topics that uh, Pastor Vince Torres is talking to you about today are of interest, I'd certainly encourage you to get in touch with the folks at Family Policy Alliance and see how you could uh, get more engaged and more plugged in. Uh, thanks for being with us today. We really appreciate the Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Today we go to Psalm 103. I am. Uh, I was had someone share with me about this recently. This passage just spoke encouragement. I don't know about you, but by Wednesday, can you use some encouragement? Come on now, middle of the week. Let's let's look at this Psalm 103. Let's look at the first five verses. Okay. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities? Who heals all your diseases? who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. You know, as you look at that passage, it reminds us that God is the source of good in your life. Now, yes. probably this week you've had at least one or two good things come your way. If you really think about it, I mean, it's, it's easy to focus on, on things that are difficult, but think about the good things. Can I tell you God is the source of those good things? You can say, no, no, those good things happen just because of, oh, circumstance, because of happen chance, I was in the right place at the right time. Uh, no, God says that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from right. the Father of light with whom there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Let's take it a step farther. Do you believe truly that Satan, as scripture describes, who goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, will ever do anything good for you? Mm. He goes about to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's what the word of God declares. Right. But it says that God's desire is to bless you. And he does. He pours good things on you. Now, if you jump down a little bit in this passage, okay. let's go down a little bit further. Let's go to pick up at verse 13. It says, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Mm. As, as for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it and is gone, and its place, remember, it, its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord, listen, mm -hmm. is from everlasting to everlasting. Now, on those who, yeah. who is it on? On yeah. those who fear him mm -hmm. and his righteousness to his children's, to children, to, now here's the last part, to such as keep his covenants, mm -hmm. His covenant and to those who remember his commandments wow. to do them. Amen. Isn't that good? That's good. Verse wow. two, I really like it. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. Amen. Keep your mind on good things. We can get so bombarded with every day, the things that are going bad, and we should always remember how good our life is when Christ is in our life, the benefits that he gives us, the blessings. Like you said, every good and perfect gift is from above, from the Father of lights who does not change like shifting sand. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He loves you. God loves you. We love you. Have a blessed day. Meditate on Psalms 103 today.